Hi everybody, what we're going to talk about this time is the design, the development, and the testing and flying of the MSL-2. As many know that have followed my builds for, uh, gosh, over 15 years or more, uh, maybe 20, I can't remember now, um, I'm very careful on how I try to share my successes and failures so I don't confuse people. It's really easy for somebody um, that's only built one airplane, let's say, to think that they um, are experts at all airplanes, okay? So what I always try to share with all of the, uh, the, my fans and followers is how I really got to the point of having success, okay? So I'm going to probably uh, bring a lot of different things into how I made this successful. So I'm trying to keep this video under 10 minutes because I just don't want it to drag on too long. But, but I want to start off with how I came up with the idea of the MSL-2. Now, this is a plastic model of a GB, and it's a 1920s, 30 era racer. And I wanted to design my own. I didn't really want to copy anything. I wanted to design the fuselage, the wings, the tail surfaces, uh, where all the systems go in, uh, the landing gear, 100% on my own. So on the MSL-2, one of the keys was, was where I was going to put all the systems in it to make sure I didn't have to add nose weight because I hate adding weight to an airplane. I try to build a plane so that where the motor's located, the batteries are located, the landing gear, which is pretty heavy, located, all helps with the center of gravity of the aircraft, okay? So the MSL started out as a, uh, a 3D drawing that I created showing the, uh, the inner structure and all the stringers on the fuselage. The first wing on it was, in my opinion, too small and the design was too flimsy. So the time uh, that I went to test fly that wing, the plane never got light because I had accidentally set the electronic speed controller only to go to 70%, which I think was karma helping me because I think if I would have gotten airborne with those first set of wings the way they flexed and stuff I probably would have hurt the airplane or lost the or lost the entire airframe so but the fuselage was built up and the reason I did that and the reason I built an inner structure that held the uh, bulkheads and then used stringers is because that's extremely light okay I ended up with a 187 inch wing airplane that only weighed 58 pounds which to me is like helium. It's unbelievable I finally hit. My target was honestly 60 pounds. I hit 58 and I was just all giggles. I mean, it was just incredible. So let's talk about the, the airframe design though. Where the wings are attached, where the tail's attached, all these have to have hard points. And you need to think about that when you're, when you're designing an airplane because just to build a fuselage and then decide, oh, I'm going to slap a wing on it, adds weight. If you're not thinking from the very beginning how you're attaching your wings to the fuselage, how your tail's attaching to the fuselage, how your vertical stab is incorporated in the fuselage, how your landing gear hard points are incorporated in the fuselage, how your firewall is incorporated into that fuselage, how all these aspects um, are addressed in the design will end up will end up helping you with a light designed aircraft So um, hopefully while I'm talking here you're seeing some pictures over here unless I'm completely screwing up this video of The processes I went to build the airplane. So the first fuselage turned out I mean the fuselage turned out really really well I was really really happy with it as I said the first set of wings I didn't like and actually I didn't like the horizontal stabilizer either. It was way too light, it was way too flimsy. So it went in, the MSL-2 went into storage for a very long time. And when it came out, I looked at it, and a friend of mine, Berger, uh, and I had been talking, oh, I don't know how many years ago it was at Ceph, uh, which is a big fly-in, a, a national fly-in. We were talking about wing design. 
And I always liked Lysander um, airplane, that high wing German radial engine, whatever it is, lookout plane, or I don't know what it was used for. But the wing on that was a interesting um, uh, wing where as the, as the wing went out across the cord, the ribs got thicker. And what that did was it made the inside of the wing stall before the outside which that's what you want to have happen when you stall an airplane. You want the inboard part of the wing to stall before the outboard. That way you have aileron control all the way up to the point of uh, maybe the stall. So the wing was extremely difficult to design. Um, to get all the uh, geometry right, to get the symmetry right, uh, to get where I thought the structural loads would land on it, I had a lot of people make fun of my wing design because there are certain ribs that are just big cavities. And everybody says, why didn't I have holes in there? Realistically, cutting holes doesn't lighten airplanes that much. It's using thinner material. But what I decided to do was use a pretty thin material, but by removing all the inside of a few of the ribs and then making sure my sheeting was properly attached to it, it created a little T-bar or a, a, like a half T, like part of an I-beam. ended up being extremely strong. So I ended up with these really cool wings and I was gonna glass it, but one of the problems with glassing is that anytime you use a really light contest grade balsa wood like I do, they're sponges. So the lighter the balsa, normally the softer the balsa, which means it absorbs a lot. So when you put epoxy resin on it, it almost soaks through. I've done some testing. You can see through the little wicks in the grain of the wood on the other side of the wood where the epoxy uh, penetrated. That's a lot of weight. So I decided to monocoat it. Everybody made fun of me. I don't give a shit. I mean, crap. So I, I monocoated the plane. It ended up light. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about um, test flying. And this is a subject that I've had a lot of my friends sending me private messages with because I've helped an awful lot of friends test fly or made in their airplanes. Myself, I've probably, I've got a log somewhere. I think I've test flown about 300 planes in my life, but I quit doing it. And the biggest reason I quit doing it is um, a lot of my pals build some really big, expensive airplanes. Okay, and I'm talking the three to five or six thousand dollar range airplanes. Um, even if it's a jet, it could be ten or twelve thousand dollars. And I just um, I don't feel comfortable because I'm not the person who built it. If they have like a loose um, uh, servo tray or the elevator servo uh, mount is loose, if they've done something in the airplane that we can't catch in a pre-flight, it just kills me to lose an aircraft. Now, if it's my aircraft, you know, I cry for two minutes, rub some dirt in it and start building a new airplane. But I have test flown so many people's planes. I think I've only lost six total. Uh, three were due to aileron uh, reversal, which still is mind boggling to me that five people could look at one airplane and still have the ailerons reversed. Um, another one was uh, put the nose down, got into a high speed dive and had flutter in the elevator and lost the tail and crashed it. Um, I don't remember the other ones, but one thing that I've never done is, knock on wood, is crashed. Um, well, let, let me let me re say this: the only time I've never lost an entire airframe is on landing. I've put some landing gears through the wings. Okay, so one of the things I and I'm not going to get too deep into this, but one of the things I want people to really understand is what makes an airplane fly. Everybody says, well, as long as I got airspeed, you can't stall. That's not true. You can accelerate an airplane. If the airplane, if you're just flying along and you get a real high angle attack, and let's say it stalls at a real airplane at 60 knots. Now let's talk about a model airplane. Let's say that model airplane stalls at 20 miles an hour. Nose drops, okay? The reason it's stalling is because the, the wing has reached a high enough angle of attack that as you all know from Bernoulli's principle, that, well, and there's a debate out there if that even works, but what we've all been trained for for the last hundred years is that when the wind parts from the top of the wing you lose lift boom plane goes crash and you and you got to convince your loved ones you're going to build another one but when you're going really really fast and you pull that nose up because of the inertia going forward and the g's you start to pull on the wing 
it's very possible, even at full throttle, to pull the nose up fast enough that that angle attack goes high enough that that wing stalls. And it's because the plane's not wanting to, to go up as you pull back on the elevator because it's going so fast. The, 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 inertial, the inertia of the mass of the airplane wants to keep going in the path it's going. So when you pull that nose up, you stall the wings. That's called an accelerated stall. So what happens is when you add weight to an airplane, okay, for you need more speed to fly. So let's say at 20 mile an hour your plane stalls, okay? Now let's say you're turning base to final and you're pulling back on that stick. Think about this, if you're flying level and you're pulling back on that stick, what happens? You're slowing down. So when you're going from even downwind to base or base to final, don't get slow on a test flight, okay? Keep the nose down. The time you wanna slow down is that last four or five feet off the ground. And if you've got plenty of runway, it doesn't matter if you float the whole runway or even if you gotta go around. Don't get slow landing an airplane that you've never flown. It is the death of the plane. Another thing you want to be careful of is if it's a high performance thin wing, be careful how much aileron you use. Ailerons will change the, the, the cord of the angle of attack. So if you're in a high bank and you're pulling G's and you start to put that aileron down, that aileron is actually increase, in, increasing the angle of attack of that tip. Next thing you know, you stall away and you crash, boom you gotta go build a new airplane. So it's really, really important to think that if you fly an airplane fast down the runway and then, and then come around, it's gonna be able to land. I've heard people say, well, nobody could land that airplane. What are you talking about? The airplane's flying. The airplane can land. That's the dumbest thing anybody's ever said. Oh, you can't land that airplane. Now, you might land going 40 miles an hour. You might blow the landing gear off it, but it's a lot better than augering it in. So think about it like this. If you're turning from base to final and you got half throttle, okay? And let's say the plane's out of trim, which I've had many planes out of trim. My MSL2 when I first test flew it, um, I used a whole bunch of down elevator to get it to fly right. And notice that I actually had too much up elevator trimmed in in the original trim. Um, but plus, um, the, the airplane, uh, I found out that my wing incidents, the, the, my wing is just about one degree higher than it should be which would make it want to climb. So that's the reason I needed it down. But I don't care what the airplane's doing. Fly the airplane at half throttle or more, unless it's really underpowered, you might be at full power. Whatever it takes, when you do an orbit around the field and the plane's stable, do that same thing when you're coming out of base to final. Come in hot. But then when you get down to like two or three, four feet, start bringing the power back and see what the plane does and ease the power back. If you've got a, a, a thrust uh, problem on your engine and you just chop the power back, you may not know it. That motor might have been pulling your nose down, and when you chop the throttle, the plane pitches up. I've had that happen on an extra 260 to me one time. I almost lost the plane. I knew as soon as I took off, the trims were all out, and I was like, holy crap, what's wrong with this plane? I had no idea that I had way too much down thrust in the engine. I had like five degrees, and it needed a half a degree, okay? Um, and as soon as I chopped that power back, the plane shot up in the air and I was like, holy crap. So when you're flying an airplane, if it goes down the runway and it goes into the air, it can be landed. Just be very, very careful. When you're turning, um, I saw a B-17 one time, a guy was flying really slow and he, and this wasn't the test flight, he was turning from base to final really slow and it just slowly augered over and went in. Now, he blamed the radio. I watched the video 20 times on that. It wasn't the radio. It was he had kicked in a ton of aileron, didn't use any rudder. Rudder's your friend also when you're flying a model airplane, okay? Um, I actually talked to a P-51 pilot, full-scale pilot. He told me normally when you land a P-51, you hardly ever touch the ailerons once the flaps are at full. You use your rudder for 90% of your, your um, uh, uh, you know, aiming it at the runway. So um, model airplanes are the same. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you're gonna design an airplane from scratch, you're going to build it, you're going to finish it, which is hard. Finishing airplanes is hard. I don't know how many planes get to 95% and then they never get done. And then you decide to fly it. If it gets into the air, it can be landed. Just remember, scratch build airplanes. Um, I don't wanna say scratch build. An airplane you've designed from your own plans do not have the incidents proven yet. 
Okay, most scratch build planes that are built from plans, somebody has already figured out the incidences, somebody's already figured out the thrust, somebody's figured out how it's gonna track on the ground with the landing gear. But when you build an airplane 100% from scratch, your own design, when you go to fly it, you have to be so ahead of that airplane to know uh, what could go wrong. Now, luckily on the um, MSL2, it flew on rails. So all my math, all my calculations and everything paid off. Uh, it has a cube wing load less than a glider, and it flew like a glider. Now, because the drag, it doesn't have the penetration of a glider. So I hope you like my videos. I hope this was informative. I want you to really understand if you don't try, you're never going to do anything. The coolest thing about, um, you know, the coolest thing in the world you can do is start with nothing and create something really, really cool. And it's not for everybody else to pat you on the back. It's not for everybody else to uh, give you an applause. When you take a sketch, turn it into a 3D model, take that 3D model and turn it into uh, a real CAD document of parts you're gonna cut. You cut those parts out and you build the airplane. And you know, I've got about 650 hours in the MSL2 uh, building it. And when you think about that 10 or 11 years I've spent on that airplane on and off, and for it to fly as perfect as it did, that is why I do it. And I hope anybody watching this that wants to build their own airplane from scratch, do it. Do it on a smaller scale, okay? Don't start like I did, okay? Don't, don't have $6,000 in an airplane. Start at a smaller scale. Um, 40 inches, 50 inches. Um, my sweet spot is 80 inches because it's big enough that the wind won't affect it, but it's, it's uh, small enough that you can afford to build it, okay? So if you want to build your own design, it's not that hard. Well, take time, yeah. Are you gonna fail? Yes. Is things not gonna fit? Yes. But do it, I mean it. So hey, thanks for watching my videos. I really enjoy everybody sending all the hundreds and thousands of emails I get. I try to get through all of them. I do answer every one of them except the Russian gal looking for a husband. So everybody uh, have a great day. Rock on and build something. Take care, everybody.